<laughs> the brave, right? That, there you go. <laughs> so why study humor in non-human animals? Well, importantly, humor draws on social intelligence, anticipation of the future, appreciation of the violation of expectations, and I would argue, importantly, the capacity for joy. Like this group has a really incredible range of researchers there. Um, you know, whether they're studying insects or birds or non-human primates or as some of them call them human primates, <laughs> right? Studying all, all kinds of primates. Um, so yeah, having that set of people in the, in the mix, people who study um, all sorts of different species and their diverse intelligences, uh, not to mention some of the people coming from more of the humanities perspective, that's been really incredibly stimulating and yes, mind-blowing is a good word for it. That's the bee brain. What I've done is build a computational model of the mushroom body of the bee brain, which is the bee's cognitive center. And this model captures the structure of the mushroom body and all the features that influence information processing through the mushroom body. When it comes to understanding the evolution of intelligences, we know that there's not just one type of intelligence. So every animal species and perhaps also plants have their own intelligence that should be understood in their own right. And my project focuses on New Caledonian crows. Our work is actually on uh, brainless intelligence, so no neural systems. Here you can see just one example. This, this whole thing is one cell. So here he is uh, going about his business collecting uh, food and, and foraging and so on. These kind of single cell organisms were able to handle their behavior, their physiology, and their morphology. Look at the little head on the end of the stalk. Are we alone? We have to quit showing people at SETI an astronomer looking up at the stars and saying, gosh, are we alone when there are humpback whales tugging at our, our genes saying, you know, hable espanol and parle du francais, and <laughs> trying their best to communicate. We can really cast in quantitative engineering terms what our values look like. The more progress we make on that, then that really it's going to force us even more to question, are these the right values now? <laughs> are these the values we want to have? Right? If we're putting values into machines or we want our machines to reflect our values, it's also an opportunity to reflect on our own values, maybe with more precision than we might have had before. Sorry, I really wanted to catch this. All right, everyone knows how this goes, but I am going to take my moderator's prerogative to launch us off with a question. The, the question is, what relationship does, does the panel see between this more traditional, as it were, kind of, you know, more Cartesian model of intelligence, where you're sort of trapped inside your head, and that's where the intelligence happens, and these more distributed, um, skill-based ways of thinking about it? Like, do we think these are in competition? Um, do we think that um, they should be integrated, or what? I think in, when, in researchers who, who work with non-human animals, I think there's often a, a kind of clarity and an understanding that intelligence is niche-specific. And so your intelligence always judged against the, niche, the environmental niche that you're in and whether it's appropriate for that niche. When, you know, he was working in the patent office, he was commissioned to come up with a plan for the synchronizations of the blocks of the railway stations in Switzerland, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. 40 talks in one day is as far as my experience goes, the record. Yeah. You lot yeah. were having to negotiate yeah. across all kinds of boundaries. Yeah. yeah, and that too is sort of, there's a tension there between feeling stretched beyond what one's comfort zone, but also feeling sort of, you know, enriched by doing that. The topic was on intelligence, and um, yeah, it, uh, it, the word intelligence and other things associated with it, like I was talking about creativity, they're very broad terms, and because it was an interdisciplinary audience, when people heard that term, they were probably all thinking of slightly different things. And um, and not just that, like what it means, but how to test for it, how to think about it. So the AI researchers were probably, you know, thinking of their computational models and the psychologists were thinking of the animal psychologists, what their animals do when they're being <laughs> intelligent and the hu human psychologists, something else. So, yeah. Uh, I think that that's, so it's, it wasn't just that we were interdisciplinary, but we were talking about these things that are a bit, um, are not technical, are kind of common sense words that are fluid and used in different ways.